Hello, everyone. So happy to be here. Um, I've been already talking about this experience since I arrived because uh, it's a place I always wanted to visit and I never had the opportunity. And it is my first visit, but I think that it's not going to be the last one. Um, I love the city and I loved seeing um, capsules of different historical moments. And I think this is extremely important. My architect is speaking. Um, and I hope that you preserve all historical moments um, to project that sort of continuity that your culture has achieved, which is amazing. Um, my background is, um, is interesting and curious and, and a little odd, and I want to just mention three things that really shaped me as an academic and really inform the work that I do both for my clients and for my students. I started as an architect, so I really studied design, uh, and I still consider myself a creative person, but then I moved on to media and art history and architectural history, and this is where all is coming out. Um, and finally, the business school. And when I, 10 years ago in 2008, when the financial market was collapsing in the US and all over the world, uh, I decided that luxury should be my bread and butter, which was very ironic for the time being, um, because as I said, everything was in a complete disaster around the world. But to me, that is extremely important if we understand that luxury is even bigger than art. Um, and luxury is a notion, a concept that all people and all cultures can relate to. And, and so what I brought to you to today in my presentation is some sort of a futuristic uh, foretelling of what the next three to five years could be for various businesses in a variety of sectors and industries um, here in Armenia, but also all over the world. And then a second part, which is really a technical know-how on how to tap into either defining a very special product or service and figuring out a specific market segment and then devising and very engaging strategy. So hopefully <laughs> my time will allow me to cover all these things. Um, so let me just start. One thing that we need to remember is that all of us are delivering something to our clients. And just the process of delivering a service or a good means that we believe we bring some added value. Therefore, whether we are consciously part of the market or even if we are in other areas like research or in museum work, or in some other sort of archival type of work, we're all in the end delivering value to the end consumer. Now, that sort of value has changed throughout the years in what consumers, viewers, audiences are expecting to see and receive from different organizations and different providers. So what I have here is one of the main um, well, of the several uh, graffiti artists who were commissioned to do work for the legendary Parisian retailer Colette. Some of you who travel often to Paris may know the name. They don't exist any longer. They're out of business. It was a very deliberate decision. But Colette changed the way we understand the luxury market because they were the first retailer that managed to do a very authentic marriage between commercial products, uh, sneakers, clothing, anything you can imagine, and something much more intangible. Um, art, in all its expressions, here graffiti art, and experiential events, including music, 
writings, readings of literature that actually engaged the audience. So in that sense, they were a precursor to, to what has become a standard in the luxury market today, which is some sort of experiential participation of people in that sort of event. Now, when people ask me to give them a vision of what the luxury market looks like today, I show them this. And it's a desert, and it's full of sand, and the wind blows, and as the wind blows, it changes shape. And, and this is important to keep in mind because it is really, really hard today to have a very well-defined understanding of what the market is. The forces, not the wind, but other forces that are changing the market are anything from technology, finance, uh, political issues, that's the most important thing, social issues, and so priorities in the luxury market are changing. And, and the reason I start there is that the most important question that we're here to answer today is how, should, how can we know how the change is coming? Where is it coming from? And how is ta taste changing through all these um, forces that are shaping the commercial environment? Now, um, there are many people who have studied taste um, and, and they've done it very systematically with empirical research. I'm not going to give you numbers today. Today we're looking at a very broad bird's eye view of the landscape and try to figure out what type of information we need to really make an impact for today, but also as Anna said, for tomorrow. Because especially for a country like Armenia, um, really at the cusp of change, because that's how as an outsider see it, uh, a really wonderful time with a lot of opportunity to do things well and do things in a way that resonate with young people all over the world. So in essence, everyone in here has a job and your job is not to talk to each other, not to only talk to other Armenians, because that is the easy part of what you're doing in whichever sector you're competing or you're working, but actually to bring attention from the global network to what is happening in Armenia, actually to what has been happening in Armenia since antiquity. So um, how do we do that? A lot of people, especially in the US, which is the environment I'm really familiar with, hone in to numbers. And of course, numbers are very important because technology is allowing us to gain insights about consumer behavior. My take on this is that numbers can only give you one aspect of the situation. But the real um, way to move forward is to ask questions. And for me, um, this is happening when we know how to incorporate contextual information and create something um, that I coined the term cultural util utility. So what is cultural utility? Cultural utility is for an organization, for a business, for a brand, to be able to provide a very well-defined product or service, but make sure that it is really um, a type of product that resonates with the consumer. So I'm going to show you how this has been done and where are the areas for improvement and how you could tap in in that sort of um, way to deliver innovation to your customers. Now, here's an interesting story. Americans love to do that. Um, I am a new American, I'm only 10 years old as an American, uh, and I don't know how to talk baseball, so I'm not going to give you a baseball story, but I'm going to give you a story from the 2016 Olympics, because it is really very, very interesting and uh, extremely powerful. And I don't even watch wrestling, but that has stayed with me. Saori Yoshida had been the champion for many, many, many consecutive years. And the American, Helen Maroulis, wanted to win. So
So she hired all sorts of new coaches that had very good technical expertise, knew about performance, manipulated her diet, manipulated the way she moved her body. And no matter what she had done, she hadn't been able to win against uh, Yoshida. So she thought about it, and she realized that what she was missing was that contextual information, that sort of cultural, unspoken, intangible information that gets communicated sometimes through body language, through the way I look at you and you look at me, um, and that we don't realize we all do because we are products of our culture. So what she did, very smart lady, she studied Japanese. So there was a wrestler who should be devoting her time in more practice, and instead of practicing and, and trying to improve her performance, she learned Japanese to understand the way, not what the coaches were telling Yoshida, but how they were communicating their instruction to her. So I leave that with you, and let's come back to it a little later in the slides. Because to me, this is truly how one can perform at really high degree in the market today. And, and I'm saying this because I'm observing a lot of failures in the American market. So all my lessons that I've learned from what I observe in the market, I'm bringing to you and I'm also bringing to my students, trying to um, instill that desire in a lot of professionals and businesses to be a little bit more sensitive to cultural differences and how to articulate uh, in very clear language what your own culture is about. And, and here you have an advantage, actually. So, what are some of the contributing factors that are changing the market? Uh, three main things. One is that the market is global, but it's also very local. So, global, which is a really funny word. Um, and I will explain what that means. Then I'll talk a little bit about Generation Z, which is even younger than millennials, and are the ones that are really taking over the world in a very peaceful and graceful way. Uh, and I will explain why. And of course, the last one, which is the whole idea of wellness. Um, and wellness um, can be interpreted in a very limited way, but uh, you will see in a few minutes what I mean about it. So I'll start with the first one. And the first is that um, millennials really started um, the whole movement of how to achieve efficiency in the market. And the way to achieve efficiency is through what we call the shared economy. So that's why we've seen Airbnb, whether we like it or we hate it. By the way, I don't endorse any of the companies that I show you up on the slides. Uh, these are examples from the market. Um, in fact, I have a lot of objections <laughs> with what people do. But anyway, uh, Airbnb is one of these instances of shared economies where people decided there is a lot of empty real estate that is cheaper than hotels, and perhaps we can take advantage of it. Or the fact that there is a company that is a huge success in New York City and in the US in general called Rent the Runway because it's very expensive to be dressed in luxury clothing every single day, but if you rent it and you keep it for a week, uh, it's not so expensive. So a lot of young people are actually getting dressed on borrowed clothing, which is very interesting. And finally, Uber, um, who um, initiated the whole idea of, of shared rides, and I know that you have something equivalent here in Armenia. And in fact, don't think about um, the particular industry in which each one of these companies compete, but think about the general problem that they're going to solve. And this is how they're going to grow as companies. But the truth is that we're not going back we're not going back to an old version of the market. Uh, the shared economy is here to stay. And in fact, we're going to see much, much more, much more of this and collaboration. The second thing that has to do with globalization is the fact that consumers today are on digital. 
and they move in digital tribes. Now, I've only put Facebook on here because I know that Facebook is very big in Armenia, but actually in the US, we've moved away from Facebook and we're mostly on Instagram. It doesn't matter which platform we're talking about, but the truth is that people congregate not in the physical world, they congregate in the digital world. So if you have clients, whatever it is that you're selling, if you have constituents, whatever cultural message you want to send out, you need to figure out where your constituents are. Second aspect of this is that because they are in all these platforms, the world is very fragmented. So people are not at the same place like you are in physical life, in real life, so you need to go find them. In fact, there is no linear message any longer that gets out um, from uh, organizations or from brands or from businesses to consumers because there is no such thing as TV any longer the way we knew it, where you could have advertisements, you could have announcements, public announcements. Nobody's watching TV the way we knew TV. So if, if you're on Hulu or on some other subscription platform and you're not allowing for interruptions, you're basically protecting yourself against anyone who would like to access you. Now, there are many ways for advertisers to access you, but that's a whole other issue. But the problem is you have a very fragmented market, right, that happens in a digital world. And so what is the reality for all marketers, no matter what they're selling, is um, the digital natives are there. Technology changes very quickly, so that means that you need to very quickly become efficient in different platforms, different technologies, and be able to go found, find your clients and talk to them. Most businesses concentrate on retrieving data without being able to see the large picture, so they're interpreting very um, um, narrow uh, insights. And also the fact that these digital natives move together so in fact, word of mouth is more important than any kind of paid ad that you're going to, to create to target them. And why this happens is shown on the diagram on the right-hand side. This is from a group of uh, marketers who worked for Boston University, and they defined the way we, all of us, participate in any kind of market. We all basically operate within these three environments. We are either seeking functional value, and that's very easy to understand. We want to buy a suitcase to travel, we want clothing to be dressed against the cold, et cetera, et cetera. We're looking for symbolic value, and that's extremely important within the luxury market, where what type of brand you're holding or you're wearing uh, projects a certain message. It's very important in the art market where what type of art you're buying projects a certain message. And the third um, world is the world of experiences, experiential. This is the most difficult to tackle, actually, because um, experiences are ideas and feelings that start with the individual. It's a very subjective field. But it really influences everyone's purchasing behavior. So um, while you may have created a perfect exhibition with a great message, with great quality works of art, you never know whether you're hitting all three motivational levels of your consumer. So something to consider, and we will again return to this, I promise. I make a lot of promises today. Uh, but in, in the US, we do have actually proof that this is what sells today, experiential. And what I have here, there are small uh, images because the content is not um, what I'm trying to communicate here, it's rather the, the why. On the upper left hand side you have a, a, a screenshot from an Instagram account from a company called The Pint Shop. The Pint Shop is um, a retail proposition of the Museum of Ice Cream, yes, we have the Museum of Ice Cream in New York City, 
where people like to go because it's all painted yellow and pink. Imagine an ice cream cone, right, and, on, and the colors that it has. And it's very photogenic. So people like going to that place. Um, you need to reserve to get in. The lines are around the block. It has created a sensation, uh, which is a mark of the times because sensationalism is a mark of the times and it's extremely bad, uh, but also can be used in marketing. And people love it because then they post their pictures and so it's a, um, a cycle that grows exponentially. The same thing happens with real art. For those of you who are from the art world, you know that the more Instagrammable the art piece, the more people will come to look at it. So there is where good quality two-dimensional paintings are missing out, really, because something like Yayoi Kusama, a Japanese pop artist, um, who is still creating environments that are very psychedelic and very interesting and different, um, is actually achieving the same effect through sensationalism. And a lot of people visit her uh, installations um, to take pictures and post on Instagram. And uh, the one in the middle is from a media company. So let's talk a little bit about media as well, because since we all operate on so many different digital platforms, it goes without saying that a lot of businesses today are morphing into becoming a media company. So if you have a product and you're not at the same time producing content, information, it's very hard to compete in the market. Which means uh, that while the art gallery or art museum newsletter has had the same purpose, it needs to reinvent itself and become something much more engaging, shorter because people have a shorter attention span because of all this fragmentation of the digital landscape, and also be very visually engaging. So, Refinery29 is an amazing media company, and I say amazing, this is a word I tell my students never to use, and here I am, uh, because it has a very clear mission, and their mission is gender equality, whatever gender means to whomever. And they achieve that by um, not only paying attention to their graphic representation, their stories um, graphically, through pictures, through design, but they also create this um, pop-up installation called uh, 29 Rooms that is that sort of sen sensationalist uh, experience and has the same effect. It has become a destination. So many people, rather than going to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, prefer to go to these interesting experiences. Now let me flip it around. The other thing is happening as well. What you have at the bottom is uh, Eckhaus Lata, a duo of fashion designers whose designs are so conceptual and, and artistic because let's accept that fashion is also art, right? There, there, there is no high art and low art. Uh, that's a very old-fashioned way of looking at creations. There is art. So the Whitney Museum of Art in New York City has included their work for the first time in a non-fashion-specific museum and has allowed them to have a retail store in the museum. So the, the famous saying, Andy Warhol's, right, the department store becoming a museum, the museum is becoming a department store, it's happening. And it, it proves the merging of these worlds that was facilitated because of all this technological impact we have had on the market. Quick definition of the various generations that are the market reality today. These are your customers, whether you like it or not. They're the ones who are making money. If they're not making money yet, they're inheriting money. So you better pay attention to them. And they will be buying art because they are much more visually articulate than we were when we were growing up. And there is a reason for that as well. So how are they really impacting the market? This is the result of a survey done for UK-based and US-based Generation Z consumers, 
what are the top brands that come to mind when they were asked which brands they recognize and they respect. The first one is Amazon, the second one Instagram, the third one Google Maps. First one is easy to understand, efficiency, ease, speed, delivery. Doesn't exist here, does it? No. Lucky you. Uh, Instagram, because of the sensationalism that I just explained. And Google Maps, because these kids don't know how to read a real map. They've never learned to orient themselves in a city, so much so that a student of mine, when I asked them to introduce themselves at the beginning of the semester of what is a great achievement, one said to me, I did the tour of Europe and I lost my phone and yet I got on the train on time. I found the train station and I got on it. So we were all, you know, we admired her, and, but it actually proves that without their phone, they cannot function. So that's another um, way to think about business because it's not only websites and all this world that gets um, online, but it's actually very much mobile. In fact, in New York City, the sad uh, view in, on the streets right now is every single person is looking down on their phone every single person, and the younger they are, the more they do that. So your business, again, whatever the business is, has to also be through mobile. Twitter is losing out for several reasons. I'm not going to do equity analysis here, but people are moving to uh, WhatsApp. So 2020, which by the way is not that far away, <laughs> it's just a year and a half away, 40% of consumers are Generation Z. So this is something to really consider, that you're talking to a very different audience. And they are the most diverse group. And diverse needs to be understood in many ways. Diverse in terms of ethnicity, right? The world is global, people are marrying each other. We have new people that they're not, you know, just French, they are all sorts of things. Um, diversity in terms of gender, diversity in terms of religion, diversity in terms of many, many things, and taste, of course. Um, they appreciate speed and convenience, and yet they want to have a feel that the business is very intimate with them, which is very interesting because it's a little bit of a contradiction. Um, they like that all the systems, all the platforms, and any kind of 360, 360 meaning you know you may have a real physical store, and you may have a website selling things, and you may have a mobile app, that everything is very well integrated. They expect that. There is no other standard. And the final one, it is that they are ego-driven. So anything that is about the person is important. If you don't offer that to them, too bad, because then there is a competitor who can deliver to them what they're looking for. Now, that doesn't mean that businesses need to cater too much to too many people, um, but you just need to be very clear what it is that you have to offer, because then you attract the correct consumer. So, what do they really appreciate? Authenticity, transparency, and sustainability. And authenticity is to really tell an authentic story about what your organization is, your product is, your service is. Um, not to lie, not to try to cover up anything which is transparency, to actually reveal more than the product, to, to reveal the process through which you make something. This is extremely important to uh, audiences today. And finally, sustainability. And sustainability needs to be understood in a broader sense, not only sustainability as to not harm the planet, which is already hopefully happening, but sustainability in terms of people. So if there are people who work, let's say here in Armenia, I don't know how the carpet industry is doing, but let's hope that it's doing well. So if there are people who are growing sheep and they're giving the wool to the carpet makers, these people are part of that ecosystem. 
And sustainability means that as a business, you take care not to harm the particular people, to in fact help them thrive, to help them grow, to help them have a happy life because then the whole supply chain all the way down to whatever it is that you're selling, it is truly sustainable. So think of sustainability both as a green interpretation of the ecosystem we live in, but also economical, economic. Um, finally, we got to the third chapter, luxury uh, and wellness. Wellness, the narrow um, definition of it could be anything that has to do with my physical comfort. And if you're in the hotel business or in the spa business or in, in athletics, you deal with that. But obviously, it's much more than that. Wellness impacts architects and the way they design environments, the way this building is designed. You know, is it really a building that improves my wellness as a person? Is, is it ergonomic? Does it make communities thrive? Can I go talk to my colleague easily? So what is the social aspect of wellness? But the one that interests me in spiritual wellness, of course, it's important. One that interests me and relates directly to luxury is intellectual wellness. Because I'm, this is a book I'm writing right now. Luxury brands that have been successful through the 20th century and they're still leading in the market are brands that have produced high caliber intellectual content. In other words, they're not dumbing down their message but they are using all the tactics that I just described with beautiful images, with very well-crafted messages, with authenticity, sustainability, and transparency. But they're also having this almost like greater philosophical quest, which I know sounds very big, um, but it is true. Now, you will have to wait for a year and a half until the book is out, and then I can come back and, and explain it with lots of examples. But the intellectual is the part that is really important. If you think about it, you have a culture with a lot of um, important anchors that you want to maintain and communicate and, and make it all um, easy to understood. Here is a very good example. Who would have thought that this compendium of graphic symbols would make it into the collection of the Museum of Modern Art? I don't know, does anyone know that already? Please raise your hands. Maybe two people in here, okay. So this is part of the collection at the Museum of Modern Art. Now, it may be off-putting if you are the head of antiquities at the History Museum in Yerevan, which is, by the way, my favorite already. Um, I spent a whole day there, and it's amazing. What else is happening, or why is this happening? All these digital platforms allow us to become more visually articulate. We have access to images, and you will hear about that from my um, co-speaker. Uh, this slide communicates many things, but my reason for bringing it is to show how dependent on Instagram a lot of people are, especially for brand messaging. And how is that impacting art, contemporary art today? Well, people who are aware of these changes and who are really, as artists always are, observing human behavior, these are things that are then included in the visual representation of our world, in some sort of philosophical interrogation of how the world is evolving. This is one of my favorite artists. He's Japanese, he's based in New York City, and I like his work because while it is very, very uh, well anchored in traditional Japanese ways of painting, his messages are funny because they're part of our 21st century vocabulary. Match.com, for those who do not know, is a dating site, so you can meet your spouse. Um, or Chris Santa Maria, who does the opposite. Um, he takes images out of printed uh, journals and cuts out the images that interest him and then collages everything together in a very similar way that we collect bits of information and then we create our um, view of the world, 
um, our opinions are informed by these bits of information. So this is a little bit turned on its head how the digital world is impacting the physical world. And finally, and this is where all the intellectual wellness comes uh, to a close for today, is the fact that uh, often we operate in the world without being aware that there is something much bigger happening around us. Uh, a contemporary philosopher, his name is Timothy Mordorn, wrote a book called Hyper Objects, explaining what a hyper object is. A hyper object is something that takes tremendous dimensions on its own and only a, a, uh, reveals itself to us at some point without us knowing. For example, the financial crisis was a hyper object. It happened without us realizing it. Climate change is a hyper object. We don't have control over it. So a lot of people said that technology is a hyper object and that is too easy an analogy. For me, it's not technology that is a hyper object. It is actually the way our brain has adjusted to understanding reality. Because of all the visual information that we're absorbing, even as consumers, all the messages from brands, all the messages from artists, anything that happens around us, um, the language of emoji and everything visual has turned all of us in the Western world, which traditionally we have been analytical thinkers, namely becoming experts in a very narrow line of expertise is turning us into holistic thinkers. So the future for me is a very nice future where people from different cultures and different backgrounds will be able to communicate with each other because of a very advanced intellectual um, uh, understanding of, of symbols and images. How much time do I have? 15 minutes, I hope. Okay. Four frameworks. Very straightforward uh, advice on how to reach a luxury market. Depending on who I have in here, and I do not know what kind of business you're in, this is what I call the luxury business model. It's a diagram. You can apply it to any kind of business you have. If you're a manufacturer of carpets, you consider the carpet the star of your operation and you need to make sure that you own the supply chain, you own the expertise, you own the craftsmanship and so on and so forth. And, and this is too complex to understand and so I'm happy if, if it interests you, I'm happy to elaborate later. But basically to understand that luxury is not only about how you position yourself with pricing in the market. It is actually what happens in the operations of your business. So keep that in mind because operations is the one thing that hasn't been taught in relationship to luxury branding and, and marketing. So for that, come to me and I'm going to help you. Um, there are ways of reaching the client by looking on the right hand side and it has to do with branding, advertising, communications, education, very important. And basically what you want to do is to balance that idea of physical scarcity and virtual scarcity, which means you cannot make your product available to everybody if you want to achieve that luxury positioning in the market. So think of whether you really have something that is truly very rare or that you're going to make people believe that it is very rare. And there are ways of doing that. Once you have established the luxury operation, you need to then consider four types of customers you will be reaching. Again, a little bit too complex um, as a diagram, but basically you need to understand that this map, which is based on a horizontal and, and, and vertical axis, shows that people are moving on the horizontal axis from knowing nothing about the world to becoming experts about the world. And they also uh, move on the vertical axis from people who like objects that never change, I like this, I will buy it, or people who like experiences, things that change with time. What changes with time? Wine changes with time. Music changes with time. An English garden changes with time. 
And so depending on where your client is on this diagram, you need to adjust the messaging. Because for example, you would be insulting someone who knows a lot about antiquities if you treated them as someone who doesn't know anything. Or someone who is interested in watching the sunset from a particular place in Yerevan, um, you need to create an exhibition and that is an interesting event and makes it a holistic experience for them that is still very intellectually stimulating and it allows them to enjoy um, and collect the experience. So what you need to retain from here is that even experiences are collectibles. Not only objects are collectibles, experiences are collectibles. And this is the most fun and I think more practical um, next step. It's based on a lecture that Mark Rothko, uh, abstract expressionist, gave at a lecture at the Cooper Union, New York City. And it has seven specific steps that would allow your communications team to be very creative about the messages that you're crafting. What are the seven steps? The first one is that you need to have a sense of purpose and it has to be authentic. Example from the market, a makeup company that is doing that very well. Don't ask me why because I don't have time to explain you <laughs> right now. Uh, but I'm happy to take questions about it. Um, sensitivity. You can display sensitivity. If you're someone who is interested in the environment, you could create collateral projects that show that your organization is in fact giving back to a cause for the environment. Tension. People like things when they're a little difficult. If you give everything to them, they're not interested. So you need to create tension either in the way you display art or in the way you create ads for your exhibition. Something that leaves them wondering what's next with a cliffhanger, right? You, you create some sort of tension. Irony. Think about things that you like the most when you find them online or in printed ads or wherever. There are things that have a little bit of humor in them. We cannot always be serious even if we're talking about art, right? It, it has to have a little bit of humor and a little bit of a human um, side to it. Um, this is from a leather goods making company and Gucci of course, which has become an overnight success because specifically they uh, base their new collections on this sense of irony. Play. Don't be too serious, even if you are a museum. Be playful. Open up because that's how you're going to bring more people in. Luck. This was a tremendous success in New York City. Supreme is an urban brand. Um, they collaborated with the MTA that gives the tickets for the subway. And the theory was that you could go to the machine to buy, but you didn't know whether you would get a card that had the Supreme logo on the back. And people lined up for hours hoping, they didn't know, hoping that they would get that one Supreme card, right? So if you can incorporate luck in the way you deliver your messages, um, people will be more excited. And hope, because hope is what makes the world a better place. Hope you have demonstrated with how you handled um, recent political events, and I think it is what makes actually younger people wanting to be engaged. And my final framework, or my final guide. How many questions do you see here? And don't be shy. One, two, I'll take another bid, five, excellent. The lady, one. Why should I buy for you? Tell me, what is the product or service that you're offering? Why should I buy from you? Um, what problem are you solving for me, even if it is an intangible intellectual problem? What should I buy from you? Why specifically me? What do you have to offer to me, a Generation Z, let's say, consumer who likes XYZ? Why should I buy 
So you cannot give it to me for free? You want me to pay? Why should I buy from you? And why should I buy from you? What makes you special? Do you have that authentic story? Are you really telling me the truth? So transparency right there, right? And are you really everything you say you are in terms of your positioning in the market? So four frameworks. I have to admit, for each one of these, I spend at least one or two lectures when I lecture to my students. So it's not fair in a way to do it so quickly. On the other hand, I wanted to expose you to these things to give you something to think about. And, and you have my email. It's on the next page. And, and feel free to reach out to me. I will be very happy to help and answer questions. Thank you. I think I'm out of time, <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, does anybody in the audience have any questions for Tomai? We have about 10 minutes for questions. Yes. Huh? Thank you. This is uh, raising a lot of questions, but one that was intriguing to me was, how do you collect experiences? Uh, you collect experiences by creating collateral material that creates mementos. Can you give an example? Um, yes. So this whole idea of the retail pop-up store that allows you and encourages you to take photographs uh, for Instagram. Actually, I have to say, this is a very interesting question because one thing that didn't work for me at the museum, the history museum here in Yerevan, was that they didn't allow me to take pictures. And we're way beyond that in New York City. The Met, the Whitney, Every single museum allows you because I'm not a photographer. I don't use flash. It's a silly little iPhone that I use. I'm not going to sell t-shirts. So it troubled me and, and a little bit made me think because I want it. I, I loved a few things that I saw in that museum and I wanted to have this. So it troubled me that I have to say, this is a little bit behind, right? Because the whole world will come um, and will expect to be treated the same way they're treated in other museums. So, so for me, that was a, I wanted, it was a, a blue glass little uh, vase that was so beautiful, actually the color of your blouse. Uh, and I just wanted to have it. And so creating collateral material, it could be a mixtape, right? So if you're looking at an exhibition, but you want to create a certain emotion and you have music, maybe you want to give out for free the mixtape. Um, or any other kind of, not a replica of the thing that you were just experiencing. You're not going to give me a plastic orchid if the event was a garden opening obviously, but you're going to create some sort of collateral material that allows me to take something home. Brands are doing that very well, by the way. With photo booths, with uh, um, uh, uh, opportunities for artists to sign your particular product that you had just bought. So it's something very personal to you because you would sign it for me and nobody else would have it, but it doesn't replicate the experience that I had in the store when I had this whole experience in the graffiti, for example, opening. Um, I'm <coughs> Hi. Too late. <laughs> um, uh, I don't really know how to form my question actually very correctly, but I'm wondering, uh, let's say, are you a consumer of this market? Because I've, I always have this feeling that all of this I intuitively feel or maybe, I don't know, I learn along the way through the social media or just observing everyone. I feel like it's very hard to sell to me. How are you a consumer and how is um, the people who have money are extremely smart and they know this. So if you're selling luxury, uh -huh. how do you talk, do you talk to their subconscious or? Yes. Do you understand my yes, question? Yes, I totally understand. Yeah. 
This is a very, very important question. You're an exception, however, because you're sophisticated, you're a designer. I consider myself an exception because I study the market so much that no one can impress me any longer, which is bad because I used to love to go to shop and I don't any longer. Um, so, so that is, however, and, and now I'm going to mention a name, and it's okay, I don't sponsor them or anything, but I love them, Hermès in Paris, where um, I go to their left bank boutique. They have a bookstore in there, and every single book they have is of the highest caliber in quality of work, um, intellectual, you know, content. And the way they package it for me and they present it to me as if I had bought something that costed thousands of dollars and I usually spend 50 or 70 euros. That's what luxury is. So how can you be really confident about yourself as a business? Not to take advantage of anybody, right? And this is where a lot of businesses are, are losing us because they're lying, they're not transparent, and they try to position themselves as luxury with horrible products that they have priced very highly. We're smarter than that. So, so this is the one thing that businesses need to avoid. On the other hand, make um, a little business card holder as if it were the most amazing thing and, and give it to the customer in that way. I know we're out of time, right? Oh, okay. All right. I very much believe in the power of first impressions. And I'm curious about what you might have experienced that was close to this uh, token that you would take with you experientially by being here. And if anything, do you see a strength, a strength or an opportunity to enhance something that is of a, a layer of luxury in your time here in Armenia. Thank you. Great, okay. Am I being recorded and <laughs> given to spy agencies or anything? Um, all right, two things. The people I've met have been amazing. So all of you and the culture really have this warmth. So warmth, I think, is part of who you are. And that's amazing. Having been trained as an architect and archaeologist, I, I cannot say it so many times how much I love the History Museum because it showed me the continuity of the culture. And not very many cultures have that continuity. So when then I walked around in the city and was really faced with what I call Soviet uh, urban planning, that's striking. Um, and it's a disconnect. It's almost like someone came and, and probably that's what happened, superimposed a way of life that had nothing to do with that very fluid, very elegant. And, and the elegance, I don't know if you can see it because you're part of that culture and maybe it's so part of who you are that you don't see it, but I spent so much time at the museum because I was interested in the craftsmanship details of the jewelry, especially, I mean, forget antiquity, which already was important, 18th century, 19th century, uh, embroidery. Imagine the patience of the people who were making these things. I imagine the, you know, we're today talking about wellness and mindfulness and yoga, right? Yeah, that's what they were doing. They were reflecting and they were philosophizing and they were thinking about humanity. And, and this connection that I'm trying to make in my own work with that intellectual part of wellness is, isn't it to be human, to actually be able to ask questions? Because if you're not able to ask questions, they took away our humanity, right? And I think that that is what that sort of urban planning uh, really crushed the experience that I just had in the museum, because you need to get over that. You need to uh, hire people who are young, who know design, um, who know architecture, and start, I'm not saying bring back what was before, because that's gone, but reinvent and innovate 
as if there was no gap, as if there was uh, no interruption, how can you make it difficult? I'm not saying that it's simple, but this is where this generation is going to make a mark, and I think this is what your businesses need to deliver in order to make Armenia a destination, and you need to become a destination, right? Not the other way around, because part of who you are is that you were forced to go out into the world and go to different countries and make a different life. You've done that. Now you're here. Now invite people in to see your culture from the inside. So I think the, and, and actually the exhibition yesterday, we went, um, with Fabio, a lot of the works that we saw to me spoke about this connection and the relevance of contemporary work of art with forms that existed in older centuries. So there is something and it's there. So it needs to be reawakened, right? Difficult question. I hope they're not taking me to. We have to room for time for one more question. Okay. Mary, Mary. Yes, heart is higher in Amdalu. Um, I'd slide the word to Mr. Vaitsik, Vortakish Bater. I'd slide the word to Mr. Vetsik, Vortach Mechterum, at Shirjanadzev, slide the word to Mr. Mechterum, Baro Rutsuner. In the Tarki, the word Mus Shirjaner, the word Tach, yet a Karelia. Mus Shirjaner, the word Tach Gripater, Physicagan, Intellectual, Amenech Kawata Kartal, Vorovetev, Parcha Yerevum. Yeah, I asked her. In the Tarki, the word Mechterum has the word Baro Rutsuner, you have checked Karton, or I saw men. Parzapest Kahvatutun is there to my thinking Mechterum Unanad Baro Rutun, you have Amenia Kahvatutun is there to Baro Rutunit, as you can physical can, you have mental Kahvatutun is there to Baro Rutunit. That's I see wellness as the umbrella that covers everything, not the one thing missing or that connects. Basically, maybe it's a representational issue. Maybe I need a graphic designer to do a better work. It's not my design, by the way. It's from the Wellness Institute. It's a non-profit organization um, that has articulated this diagram as a full representation of all the pillars upon which wellness rests. Did I answer? Yes. Um, okay, very last question, and then we'll have a coffee break. Mike, uh, thank you. Regarding what you just said uh, earlier, in terms of uh, the uh, continuity of a culture and growing a new one, and uh, how patience and uh, thinking about what you do is important, would that also uh, be a revival of the craftsmanship and yes. uh, the luxury, for example, when you describe the Hermes box, where it can be reproduced many times, but that w one time design being of extreme delicate uh, design. Yes. Um, so, so here, I mean, the example was a container, right? And they yes. have achieved such high quality that they don't need to redesign it every three years, which other brands are doing, by the way. So 
you need to also create some sort of visual identity that remains continuous. Now, uh, again, as an outsider, to me that exists in the culture because I can now go around and look at artwork and say, Armenian, 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 or you would say Hermes, Hermes, Hermes. Mm -hmm. So how do you translate that brand identity into a contemporary building, yes. into a contemporary carpet that doesn't need to have the design of the old carpets because we're not the same people any longer? Uh, so what is that image today that would be authentic using the same craftsmanship methods, the same quality and everything, but speak about the concept today with visual cues from today. Uh, I've given the liberty to ask another question. <laughs> Uh, very. Um, so I was it, I was intrigued by the example that you gave about Hermes because you are saying that it's not so much about the product, but it's about basically the approach or the way that they serve you, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas earlier on you said that luxury or for companies coming into the market are trying to position themselves in the luxury segment, but not having the quality that. Um, a luxury brand or product would have. So I'm just curious to understand what is the balance between actually the product or the way that you serve something? Yes. That's one question. The second question, just curious because there's so much about gender equality and all of that and you talked about generations. I was curious to uh, hear if there is there a difference between how men or women perceive this whole uh, idea of yes. uh, okay. luxury? Let me start with this because okay. this is something, again, I have a uh, I think I'll have a chapter, I don't know. Luxury to me, or to me, uh, luxury is genderless. Okay. And again, I want you to go out and look at brands who try to do things that are, and this is very much in the US, it drives me crazy. Pink for women, blue or graphite for men. No. If I like, Something, it's because of the product's uh, exceptional quality. Don't add that glossy um, finish to make me think that it, this is for a woman. So all the good brands, you will see that they don't have a differentiation between men and women. It's the same way uh, you're looking at art. Would an art piece speak differently to a man as opposed to a woman? I hope not, right? The message is the message. Um, were men yesterday interested in seeing the embroidery? Was the embroidery a feminine art piece? No, right? So luxury should be genderless, that's number one. Going back to your first branch of the question, um, there is a selection, so, so that book that I bought, right? Um, Hermes pre-selects, curates the collection mm. of books that they have. So in fact, they have in their collection, they have a lot of art books or a lot of artists' books, which is a multiple, right? It's a, a multiple, it's an art piece. So it's inexpensive, but the value that I get as a customer is tremendous because the quality of the thing that I just bought for $50 it's fantastic, it's, a, it's an art piece. So no, there cannot be product without quality. Mm. But then you cannot just drop it. I remember uh, there was this terrible airline, I think TWA, one of these, who would throw the meal at customers. They would go through the hostesses, through the aisle, and rather than place it on your tray, <laughs> really, I experienced it, they would throw it at you. No, you cannot do that. Mm -hmm. You cannot take your customer for granted because uh, why they did that? Because you were a captive audience already. You were sitting on the plane at how many thousands of feet up on the air. Um, you, you had nowhere to go. Your customer, in whatever industry you're competing, has other places to go. So you cannot take that relationship for granted and you need to package it, if I can use that word, um, to make sure that operationally you have designed a service to match the quality of the product. Okay, now we're, now we're done. <laughs> Thank you.